once again, it's a Friday afternoon. But I stand between you and your weekend. <laughs> At my own risk, I'm sure. Well, let's get started with some mathematics, and then you can uh, go off to have a weekend. Today is the new section 4.3. I spent a lot of time with probability. The exam on this test, on this chapter, is not until the 20th of October. So I'll give you an opportunity next Wednesday for a quiz, and there'll be one or more after that for the test. It's a lot of material. The angel assignments have been made for 4.2 and 4.3. So uh, start working on it. Don't get behind in this chapter. This is typically the most challenging chapter of the course. We have uh, only just begun. It should be a song. You probably don't even know what I'm talking about. He does. He does. That's where we are today. 4.3, the addition rule. So here's a preview of coming attractions. Uh, we're going to go over contingency tables, compound events. Remember, when we first started probability, we talked about simple events, and I said, Eventually, I'll talk about compound events. Well, that's that's today. We're going to talk about or inclusive or exclusive ors, and something called the addition rule, how we calculate probabilities, and then uh, the end with the concept of a disjoint or mutually exclusive events. All right. Now, just to set the table, let's uh, let's think out loud. What's the probability, if I flip a coin, that will be a heads or a tails? Take it's one. Okay. What if it's a 60% chance of rain today and an 80% chance of rain tomorrow? What's the probability that it will rain today or tomorrow? 60% today, 80% tomorrow. So by your analogy, 140%? What do you think? Sir, uh, I'm going to disagree with that. I think it's 50%. It's going to rain or it's not. So. Oh, there. The classical approach. <laughs> <laughs> All right. That, this simple little problem is a clue that there's more going on that meets the eye. That's often the case of probability. So we need to investigate what we mean by or when we talk about or. And that's the topic of today. How do we calculate probabilities like the ones I just discussed? To set the stage, I'm going to introduce contingency or two-way tables right now. These are very useful. They come up a lot in the remainder of this course and in the 106 also. So let's take a look at them and practice doing calculations of probabilities of simple events that I'll segue in and we'll do calculations of probabilities of compound events, all using the contingency table. I have a group of 430 cadets. That's my sample space. And I'm making two kinds of observations, gender, male or female, Legacy or not, the legacy is a cadet who's one, one whose parents attended Kmart. So you can imagine for any cadet that I pick, I can make those two observations. And what I can also do for all 430, as I observe you, I can put you in one of four bins. A female legacy, a female not legacy, a male legacy, a male not legacy. And that includes everyone. No one's excluded. You are one and only one of those bins. Agreed? That's the essence of a contingency table. I break up my population by certain characteristics that are exhaustive and mutually exclusive, which just means that everybody is in one or only one of those cells. <coughs> All right, let's use a contingency table to do some simple calculations. Let's calculate the probability say the bed is A, the cadet is female. So my procedure is I randomly select one of these 430 cadets. What's the probability that the cadet I select is female? Well, 
Note that all outcomes are equally likely. Why would I even worry about that? Why is that important? And is it true? Cadet keys? Is it true, first of all, if I randomly select one cadet, are all outcomes equally likely? Well, some numbers are more than others, so you can say no, it's not. I hope you say yes, it is. All, I'm, I'm, all cadets are equally likely to be selected, assuming that our process really is random. So why would I care about all outcomes being equally likely? The outcome being who I selected. So you can use the classical approach. Thank you. Excellent. Remember, how I calculate probability depends on the situation. <laughs> And you're going to hear me mention this a lot because the challenge in this chapter is can you figure out what the situation is? And then the technique is usually really easy. But the hard part is, well, what am I doing? If I've got equally likely outcomes, then I use the classical method, S over N. And in this case, N represents the total number in my outcome space, 430 cadets. Of those 430 cadets, how many satisfy my event? My event is A, the cadet is female. How many? Read it. 30. The females go across the first row. So it's 30 over 430. And if the event is B, the cadet is a legacy, I can still use the classical approach. N is the same, my outcome space hasn't changed, my S has changed, how many satisfy the, outcome, uh, the event the cadet is a legacy? Well, we've got 155 in that column. So that's that probability. And I can do it that simply because all outcomes are equally likely. So the procedure is randomly select one cadet. All right, let's put a few more twists in it. <coughs> a compound event, well, as you might think, a compound event is just one or more simple events put together. Instead of making one observation, I'm making two observations at the same time. So in the previous example, we had a simple event A, the cadet is female. We had another simple event B, the cadet is a legacy. Well, I could create a compound event and look for, well, I can look for a couple of things. One, the first one I can look at is the cadet is a female and the cadet is a legacy. Compound event. Well, how would I calculate that probability? Go back to my contingency, or two-way table. All outcomes are still equally likely, so I calculate the probability as S over N. And it's still the same, isn't it? I'm picking one cadet out of 430. But how many <coughs> cadets meet the outcome, satisfy the event that they're female and a parent is a legacy? So that's just five. That's the upper left cell. So the probability there is five over 430. We've just calculated our first compound probability with that and. Okay, nothing too exciting, too different about that. Now, we're going to change from ands to ors, and here's where we have to be more cautious. First of all, there are two common definitions of what or means. There's the inclusive or and the exclusive or. In the inclusive or, the following outcomes are included. So if I say A or B, and I'm talking about an inclusive or, either A occurs, either or B occurs, or they both occur. And we call it inclusive because it includes the situation where both occur together. <coughs> Remember, we got a single event. So 
I can make this observation, and I could see the cadet's a female, I could see the cadet is a legacy, or I could see a female legacy. In the inclusive or, all of those are accepted. They satisfy the event. On the exclusive or, we don't accept when both of them occur. We want it strictly or. Either one happens or the other. So in that case, cadets a female or a legacy, but I would not include a female legacy. And here's a little table just illustrating what I said there to really draw the difference between an inclusive and an exclusive or. Now in this class, we're going to keep it simple we're always going to use inclusive mores, unless otherwise specified. So if I use an or, you can assume that it's an inclusive or. So P of A or B is a compound event, single trial, means either A occurred, or B occurred, or they both occurred. Okay? Everybody good with our definitions? Well, now let's calculate the probabilities. And remember, when we started the class, we asked the question, probability of heads or tails. And we had said, well, we just added two together, right? One half plus one half equals one. And yet when I ask the probability of it's raining today 0.6 and tomorrow 0.8, can't add those together. We get 1.4. That doesn't make any sense, does it? So there's something more going on here. Let's see if we can go back to our contingency table and see what's going on. Let's look at the probability that the cadet is a female or a legacy. Now, I titled this the naive approach. The same approach you took probably mentally when I ask you what's the probability of a heads or a tail. We just add them together, right? And say, well, there's still 430 cadets and 155 are legacy and 30 are female, so that's uh, 185. 185 or 400. <coughs> Sounds reasonable, doesn't it? <coughs> you know I'm setting you up, don't you? That's not the correct answer. Now, before I reveal the correct answer, can anyone see what we did that was wrong? That's stupid. Uh, you combine the yes for male and female to get 155, and you added a female yes and no and 63. Mm -hmm. So, you, I, mean, it's, well, I guess one axis can say that you can't really do that. He's exactly right. Good observation. We counted twice, we double counted. Let me show you the next slide here draw it up. What should I have counted? <coughs> I should have counted the grade cells, the 25, the 5, the 150, and ended up with 180 over 430. Well, why did I get 185 over 430 in the previous slide? As the student said, I counted this cell twice. I counted it when I went to this column total, and I counted it again when I went to this row total. I double counted. And that's really behind the reason why I can't add the probability it's going to rain today to the probability it's going to rain tomorrow and get the probability that it'll rain today or tomorrow. It doesn't work that way. <coughs> so what is the correct formula? You want to come up with a nice formula that will cover all the cases. And this slide shows glaringly the cell that got us a problem. We double counted that. So the correct formula then is, I start out by adding the two probabilities together. And that's adding the column total and the row total. But then to correct, what do I have to do? I have to subtract out this cell because I've added it in twice. But how would I express the value of that cell as a probability? Well, that's the probability of 
A and B. We calculated that earlier, remember? We said, what's the probability of a female legacy? One trial. So this, then, is going to be our addition rule, inclusive or compound event, single trial. It's a mouthful, isn't it? And the caution that the author makes a lot, and we used to do the stat out problems, you get to exercises a lot, is that we can only count once. That was our violation earlier. We counted a certain set of outcomes twice. Okay, the additional rule, that's practice. Here's the table again. And the events are F, female, L, legacy. What's the probability of F or the complement of L? Probability of F or L complement. Hmm. Well, I've got my addition rule that says probability of A or B is the probability of A plus the probability of B minus the probability of A and B. Well, that's with A's and B's, and now I just have F's and L complements. So the same pattern is just substitute. So this is going to be the probability of F plus the probability of L complement minus the probability of F and L complement. Now the letters and the symbols can make this look more imposing than it really needs to be. It's not that hard, is it? Is it? What's P of F in that chart? 30. 30. It's the probability that I select one cadet, she will be female. So that's 30 over 430. <coughs> now interpret L complement for me. In English, going back into English, L complement is what? It's not included. Everything else that isn't a legacy? So or non -legacy. non legacy. In this case we just have two categories, your legacy or non-legacy. So L complement is just our shorthand notation of saying this cadet is not a legacy. Alright? What's that probability? All right, now I have to subtract P of F and L complement. In English, what's this? F and L complement. How would you describe that cadet? Female, not legacy. So how many of those are there? 25 of those. So that would be... Uh, uh, that would be 280 or 430. All right? Not too bad, is it? You do the next one. I want to see pieces of paper and pencils and we'll get this action. You do the next one. Yeah, F complement or L. Got it? Alright, before we get started, 
translate into English, what is this uh, thing that we're calculating? The probability of anyone who's not female, um, or, or legacy. Or legacy. So we want an outcome that is not female, which we usually say male, and a legacy. So I already substituted back into our condition rule. The F complement female. So what's the probability of F complement? 150. 400. 400. What's the probability of a male? What's the probability of a legacy then? 155. And then what's the probability of a male and a legacy? And I do the arithmetic. I get, well, I guess it's 405. Yeah. Uh, 430. Get the hang of it? All right, I'll move to the next one as a, a exercise for the student. But get up, Paul, in English, what's P, F complement, or L complement? I'm looking for what? Male or anomalies. Male or anomalies. It's an important skill to have in this class to be able to translate from our shorthand notation back to what does this really mean? What am I looking at? Okay. Final concept of the day. Disjoint or mutually exclusive. When we looked at the heads, the, the example at the start of the class, and I said, what's the prob probability of a head or a tail? In that case, it worked by just adding the two probabilities together. But there's a special relationship between those two events. Can you ever have a head and a, cur and a tail occur at the same time? Not going to happen, is it? In our examples with the cadets, though, you can have a, a female and a legacy occur at the same time. You can have a male and a not legacy occur at the same time. But going back to that example of the heads and tails, they can never occur together. And in that kind of situation, which is important to distinguish, we call that disjoint or mutually exclusive. Two events are disjoint, or a synonym would be mutually exclusive, if they cannot occur at the same time. Are all of you familiar with Venn diagrams? Has anyone not seen these before? I think they're pretty common. <coughs> they work nice in probability to, to give you a visual representation of what we're talking about. Over here, the rectangle represents our sample space. That's all the possible outcomes. And so the probability, or the total area there, we would call one. Because if I sample from this rectangle, there's probability one that I'll get something that's in this rectangle. And the two circles represent different events, A and B. And the colored in portion, the red and yellow, would represent the number of outcomes that correspond to event A and B. So the relative size of those circles is proportional to the probability of the events. When my circles overlap here, when my events overlap, that means they can both occur at the same time. And I have this part over here where they overlap. This area, that shaded area, is the probability of A and B happening together. You agree? If you're now we're going to we're going to consider area equal probability, which is really a concept we explore a lot in chapter 5 and all throughout 106, area equals probability. Here's your first introduction to it. So you can see now why we have the 
the addition rule. That's the probability of A and B would be adding up all the area of those two circles, A or B. But I, I have to exclude this part because I'd be adding it twice. Can you see that that's just like the contingency table? We have the, where the double counting occurred at an intersection of a cell, a, a row and a column, a single cell. Well, here the double counting would occur right here when the events are not disjoint, mutually exclusive. Okay. Sometimes the graphical representation, representation helps people. If not, go back to the contingency table. On the other hand, if A and B are disjoint, they don't overlap, I'd represent it this way in the Venn diagram. And in that case, the probability of A or B, I can just add the two together. There's no intersection. There's no overlap. And we come up with this conclusion that the probability of A and B, when they're disjoint, is zero. You can't get a heads and a tail on the same toss. They're disjoint. The probability of them both happening together is zero. We'll take this concept and this definition back into our rule that says the probability of A or B is the probability of A plus B minus A and B. <coughs> Why did our naive approach work with the coin toss? Well, the probability of A a heads was one half, B and tails is one half, What's the probability of A and B in these disjoint events? <coughs> we were just lucky in that common example. The reason why we could get the probability of either event occurring is because they're disjoint. But then when we look at cases like the weather and some of the cadet examples, we couldn't do that. Why couldn't we? the events are not disjoint. They're not mutually exclusive. They can overlap. When they overlap, we can count things twice. That's where we get in trouble. So this is the general form of addition rule. This always works. If A and B are disjoint, this term is zero, and it drops out. But only if they're disjoint. So let's practice here. This concept of disjoint is important. I'll give the third row there an opportunity to shine. We're going to go to the movie. All right? Maybe I, I randomly select a movie from IMDb. Okay. The right thing. The event that the movie is R-rated and the event that it has four stars. Are those events mutually exclusive? Or are they disjoint? Fair enough. Not disjoint. They, you could get a movie. I'm sure there's a movie out there with four st stars with an R. All right. Next one. I randomly select a person, and I observe whether that person is a college graduate or that person is homeless. Disjoint or not disjoint? Um, not disjoint. Unfortunately, not disjoint. At your tender age, you hope the probability is very low that those events happen together. Very low, but it's not impossible. All right, number three. Uh, I select someone at random, and I'm looking at two events. That, that person is taking Lipitor, or that person takes no medication. This is from They're disjoint. Lipitor is a kind of medication. Those are disjoint. All right, good bottom. Just want to feel get this one right. This one. I select a cat, cadet, and I'm looking at two events. Cadets in the rat line or member of RDC. You say they can't happen. Nope. No, can't happen. I don't know. I, I could. I think we could make a good <laughs> argument for that. Maybe it should happen. Is that what you're saying? <laughs> but it doesn't happen. No, those are just joint events. 
at this day and age in Myanmar. And obviously, I hope it's obvious, complementary, and the event is complementary disjoint. By definition, one is everything that the other one isn't. And that's how we get to these sets of equations that I introduced the other day. The probability of A and its complement is one. And from this very fundamental observation, I can just move the algebra and get these two equations. And I said, we will be using those. They will come in handy. All right, any questions so far? That's all the new material, but we're going to do a lot of practice now. Yes? Is it the complementary against A and A bar must be disjoint together uh, in that last slide? Yeah. If they're complements, they are, by definition, disjoint. They've got to be, because one is everything else the other isn't. Okay. There's no intersection. Okay. Is everyone, I, I, I've learned that I cannot make the assumption that everyone is familiar with the deck of cards. That, that's, that's fine. So let me do a, a quick review here. It's good to know this because we're going to be using cards a lot to calculate probabilities. They're really convenient to construct examples. There are 52 cards in a standard deck. There's four suits of 13. Uh, we have spades, hearts, uh, diamonds, and clubs. And the spades are always have black symbols, black numbers. Hearts and diamonds are red, and clubs are black. So if you're not a card player, your assignment for the weekend is become familiar with a deck of cards. I'm going to make you possibly better poker players. I'm not going to teach you how to bluff, but we will be calculating odds a lot better. So the next time you're not going to try to fill an inside straight or something silly like that. Now, I want you to take out your pencils, paper, Work on these problems. What's four of thirteen? Hmm? What's four of thirteen? Four suits of thirteen. Right. Each suit, spades, hearts, diamonds, clubs, has thirteen cards. So that's our sample space. <coughs> Work on these probabilities. I define a face card as a king, a queen, or a jack for our purposes. So I've got 13 over 52 for P of black. 13 over 52. Okay. And then um, for probability of face cards, I got 12 over 52. Mm -hmm. And then minus uh, 3 over 52. Everybody agree? Ooh, I think we have a dissent here. Ben Arnold, do you have a dissenting opinion? There are uh, two sets of black cards. Both the clubs and the spades are black. 
So there's 26 black cards. P of black would be 26. How about probability of face cards? Does that agree with that? Three face cards in each suit, so that's 12, 22. <coughs> How many black face cards are there? Six. And the total would be uh, six plus one, I guess that's 32. Okay, on to the next one. The probability of ace or queen. Well, by the way, are these events disjoint? No. No, because there could be a black face card. The black face card, the probability is not equal to zero, black and face. So then. Good. Probability of ace or a queen. Because you can't have a queen that's an ace or an ace that's a queen. This last term is the probability of getting a card that's an ace and a queen. Not going to happen, is it? Yeah, so that's zero. Are these events disjoint? Yeah. I deliberately picked two disjoint events. The third term is zero, so the total probability is 8 over 52. Okay? Just need lots of practice in these problems. You'll get good at it. Probability a red card or a diamond. Yeah. 
Yeah, if it now use a formula, that formula is going to be P of A P of B minus P of A and B is equal to the probability of A or B. And now what do I do? That's the formula. Plug in. Just substitute. What do I know? P of A, 0.05. I don't know P of B. Do I know P of A and B? That's zero. And A or B is 0.2. So what's the probability B? <coughs> Are these events disjoint? Uh, yeah, Lucas? Uh, and how could I tell? <coughs> I didn't hear it. No, no, I'm not sure. Size, do you agree with it? No, you don't agree with him? No, I don't agree with Okay. Justify your answer. Support your answer. You don't know because I know the wrong answer. <laughs> you just don't believe him. <laughs> All right. Can I keys? Is it disjoint? It is disjoint because? Uh, it's A and B, zero. Exactly. That's why you don't even have to know anything about the events. You know that this probability is zero, they're disjoint. Probability and B is zero, they're disjoint. That's the definition of this disjoint. All right. Uh, all right. One last problem. I'm selecting an integer between one and ten. Calculate the following probabilities. Divisible by three or even. Or the event equal to one. 
they got through the calculations and you'll end up with eight tenths. Have a good weekend. Come back, rest and refresh. Eager to learn. That was disgusting. We will. I'll be here. Here we go. 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 Here we